Mark, how are you, brother? I'm good, thank you, Chris. How are you, <laughs> mate? I'm 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 absolutely delighted to have you on the show. Thank you, mate. Um, when I open my eyes at four o'clock this morning, rather than put my trainers on and jog around the block, which is my usual routine, I um I had a green smoothie, then I made a cup of tea, and then I went back to bed with this one. <laughs> Brilliant, mate. Thank you. And um. I think if anyone wants to live vic- all all those of us that used to shake a mean hoof back in the 90s and 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 still do to this day uh and who wondered what's it like to be the guy in the booth <laughs> and you know what 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 sort of challenges we face because obviously uh, we only see the glamorous side in the clubs and the and the raves and this sort of stuff um this is the book folks so there'll be a link for it below it's life remixed, um, and yes, so I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Mark Wilkinson. Hello, Mark. Hi, mate. Thanks for that. That was a really lovely uh, intro and review. I really appreciate it. It was uh, there were some amazing times. I tell you that there were some incredible times. Yes, we'll come on and talk about that. But just some um, admin stuff. Did you have a DJ name, or you were just Mark Wilkinson, weren't you? Uh, Mark Wilkinson under my own name, but I uh, was in a couple of production outfits, one called Problem Kids, uh, one called Kid Stuff, and then Dab Hands. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I had a various different labels, record labels. I did I worked with Junior Boys Own, paper recordings in Manchester, uh, and started my own Kidology record label as well. So lots of names, lots of monikers, but Mark Wilkinson was my, was my obviously is my name and was the, was the name that I went under as a DJ. Interestingly enough, there's another guy called Mark Wilkinson who came after me, and he actually didn't go with Mark. He, he actually just calls himself Wilkinson, uh, and he's had some great success in the EDM world as well. But because he he, he, I went first, he didn't, use, he didn't use his own name, bless him, so I love that. <laughs> Yes, it's why I wrote all my memoirs under my own name, because I think Chris Thrall, Chris Thrall, it just sounds like a good author name. Yeah, it's, solid. It's like those two short blocks that look, look good on the front of a novel or whatever. So, um, yes, you touched there on back in the day. Um, we're going to expand upon that. I, I just, I, I'm um, feeling good now for all the people that are watching that know what exactly what we mean when we said back in the day it was it it was incredible times for many of us it was certainly one phase in in what i would call my enlightenment Mm. most definitely um and of course you know enlightenment comes with a bit of pain and, and and a few mishaps and times when it doesn't doesn't always go right and when when parties go wrong they can go seriously wrong as i've had the mis misfortune um to find out but um back back to you mark should we start at the beginning how how does how did you become an international house dj uh thank you for asking mate yeah i mean look it was uh it was music that first sort of grabbed my soul when I was like six years old. I remember walking down into my mum's front room and she was listening to like Elvis and the Beatles on an old record player or whatever. And I was just like, I was like, what is this? You know, just giving this feeling goosebumps up, you know, up my spine. And it was like, wow. And it wasn't, it was never the little ballads. It was always the, the you know, the big songs, you know, uh, the uplifting songs. I was always like, this is amazing. And I just got into, you know, uh, I remember anytime I got a bit of money off my paper round or anything else that I did, uh, I'd go and buy vinyl and I'd bring it home and listen to it on a record player. I remember mum buying me my first record player for my own room upstairs. So it was like, you know, all these things. And music was just, it's just something that just, it just spoke to me. I tried um, playing the piano for a while and I gave it up and my mum said, you'll regret that. And she was right. Um, then also I played the trumpet for a while. I played various different musical instruments, but I never really stuck at it. Um, but I was musical and I loved music and, and, uh, I left school at 16 with a couple of qualifications because I was a bit of a tear away. I never really concentrated very much. All the school reports said, uh, Mark's uh, an intelligent boy, but he gets easily distracted and, you know, you know, never amount to much and all that stuff. 
Uh, but the bottom line is, is that I just followed my dream. I went with music. I went through a couple of odd jobs, as you read in Life Remixed. Um, but somehow I just found myself in the middle of 1988, 18 years of age, standing in the middle of a dance floor in central London uh, as Danny Ramplin and the rest of the guys brought house music back to uh, the UK. Uh, and I was right in the thick of it. And, and the next thing you know, I just continued on and on and on. I got a job in it. Well, I learned to mix records and I ended up with a job in flying records in Kensington after two or three years of knocking around uh, the clubs and stuff like that. I got this job and I just became a, a DJ. I used to give out mixtapes and, you know, and people would book me to play at their clubs and their after parties and all this stuff. And it just, it just took on a life of, of, of its own. It just developed over, yeah, 20 whatever years in the end uh but traveling to 65 countries having a record in the top 10 doing all this incredible stuff chris uh it was beautiful it was an amazing young man's journey in many ways i'm just going to expand upon that mark if i may for for our friends at home that were never into the uh dance scene and who may not well who won't understand why it was so special to many of us house the house was a was a night it and Mark's going to come in and correct me on this, but my understanding was the house was a nightclub in Chicago and it was a place where uh, the black kids and the white kids could come together and dance without fear of prejudice because it was all about the music. Um, house uh, became this beautiful mix of, of piano um, riffs. I don't know if that's the right musical term. Yep. And black, sensuous women's vocals, or, or that's what it is for me. And it, any time I hear it, even at 51 years old, when I heard it for the first time, um, you know, almost 25 years ago, I have to dance, right? Yeah. I, I say that because a lot of people say, oh, you need to take drugs to appreciate that. And it's like, no, you don't. If that's what you... Th yes, lot, lots of substances were taken... But it didn't, uh, it, it didn't, the, the, the love of the music that brought so many people together didn't just hinge on, um, you know, on the hedonistic sort of behaviour. No, I think I think they, it helped a little bit. Let's be honest. You know, it was certainly a culture around that that allowed people to dance from nine pm till nine am or whatever. You know, there was <laughs> there was some uh, some help in there. You know, some chemical help in there. Um, but you're you're quite right. I'll just correct you teeny tiny bit. Um, the Warehouse was the name of the club uh, in Chicago, uh, and it was Frankie Knuckles who was ba basically he was in New York and he was like. Uh, uh, second fiddle to a few of the DJs in New York and he got the opportunity to go to Chicago and start this club and work in this club as the resident DJ at the warehouse and it actually became it was just the music that Frankie Knuckles was playing they just the shortened it, it rather than Absolutely. warehouse music they just called it house music um, and that it literally is how it goes some fascinating documentaries around YouTube about this kind of progression and when house took over the world and it started it started in this little club in Chicago I'm getting little goosebumps talking about it now I never went there or anything obviously I was I was too young for that but Frankie Knuckles was the founder I mean the fact of when he passed a few years ago that the Channel 4 News and the ITV News and the BBC One News actually ran articles around Frankie Knuckles the founder of house music when he passed incredible you know to get that kind of coverage um and for me the, the music you're right yes big pianos yes big soulful vocals definitely but the real thing that held all house music together was the four to the floor drum beat you know one two three four the drum beat and that's the bit that get you, gets you dancing that's the bit you can dance to in any way shape or form right and am i right in saying it made it I'm thinking back to my short spell as a DJ. It made it easier to mix, didn't it? The one, oh, it was two, easy, three, yeah. four. If you go back to, if you can count to four, <laughs> all, all budding DJs, if you can count to four, you can mix records, right? Um, but one of the things that the disco before, it was all made with live drums. So all the disco from the 70s, you know, and even the early 80s, it was all made with live drums. And then drum machines started to come in. And then it became easier to then actually like make a tempo. And then, yeah, just literally just flow records together. And, and that's what happened. So, you know, rather than a DJ talking in the sort of cheesy nightclubs and everything, I never spoke on a microphone in a 25-year DJ career because I literally just, all my job was just to mix records together seamlessly, play sound effects, get people whipped up into a, into a frenzy. You know, that was what I did. And, and I, you know, I was pretty good at it. 
<laughs> yes. Um, I should explain, Mike. If you see me looking away, it's because I'm I'm putting stuff up on the screen for our friends at home, and I I'm looking over there at my um search engine. You uh, so I've just put a picture of Frankie up. Yeah. And yeah. it was that thing, wasn't it? That um. It, it, one of these kind of elite, let's call it a bit snobby things, but the the new wave of DJs who didn't want to be associated with the the kind of Butlin's red coat, you know, hands in the air and and, and the bloody what's it we the conga isn't it? <laughs> Come on and do. Yeah, that that, 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 yeah. so yeah. it was kind of the thing that DJs didn't want to speak on the mic. They very very rarely uh, um, and. In those cases, an MC would come in, wouldn't they? If they, yeah, I mean, we were too cool for school, right? I mean, we were we were too cool for school. We were like, you know, rejecting all the stuff that went previously. I mean, obviously, you know, rare groove music was really popular uh, in the eighties uh, in London. Uh, you had all the new romantics, you know, you had a lot of interest in music, electro, all this kind of stuff, all in this kind of melting pot. But basically, when house music came from Frankie Knuckles and then acid house music obviously started with lots of bleeps and techno y sounds and stuff like that, it just grew and grew and grew to such a, an extent. Um, and it was a joy. I was 18 years old. It was a joy to be there uh, in the middle of all of that. Uh, uh, fun if you like but uh, the bit that really got me was my addictions got out of control uh in that uh, in that particular period of my life and it, it didn't always lead to to joy and happiness despite the fact that dance floors were filled with joy and happiness of course you know we were we loved it while we were there yes yeah, so i try and describe it in my life as um there were those of us that would take the party home i hmm. mean Generally, you did take the party home for a, you know, for an after party. But there were those of us that just we couldn't help just continuing it. Anything that was still in your pocket, just that that's, and then you'd be on the phone trying to get some more. It's the um, uh, it's the nature of addiction, isn't it, Mark? Yeah. When addiction gets hold of you uh and and you're not able to control it or you haven't got the skills to be able to control it uh it can really drag you down yes yes we'll we'll come on to that but i don't want to go too sort of doom and gloom at this stage oh. because one thing i'm i really try to impress upon people and this is a common misnomer in society is drugs cannot cause addiction it's a physical it's like saying that having a you know, a nice sports car makes you have speeding tickets, right? There's a there's a big disconnect there. It's yeah, I mean, I, I've written, sorry, Chris, I've written in the book, it's the drugs, the drugs are not necessarily the problem. It's the people's addictive personalities and addictive issues, right? We've got to deal with the, the addictions, the mental health issues, all the other things that go around it. If we deal with that, then the drugs aren't the issue. Yeah, can I ask you, one thing we're quite hot on on this show, and I think we're the only people that talk about it is, we make the link between childhood trauma mm. and what happens in later life, whether that be a military um, service person who's battling PTSD, you know, with suicidal thoughts or, or all this horrible stuff that's going on at the moment, uh, or whether it's somebody like myself that uh, after I left the force, I went to Hong Kong to run a, a, what was a very successful business at the time, albeit short lived. It's where I met um, Brandon Block, funny enough. <laughs> and um, that's when my demons hit home, Mark. You know, that's when I had to pay the piper. It was a, a, a tough childhood caught up with me. <laughs> and I didn't realise when I'm taking these substances, which make you feel great, um, that what I was actually doing was masking the underlying symptoms of... of, of trauma you know from a, from yeah, i mean I, I was masking my subconscious conditioning from when i was a child yes there we go i i think we probably live with sort of uh a, a low level sense of anxiety mark people like us we don't realize it because we just think we're like everybody else but then when you take a substance which gets rid of that and you you kind of feel like normal for the first time it's yeah. so tempting to keep chasing that behaviour, isn't it? 
what I've learned, yes, what I've learned is over the the life experience that I've had, and that's what I've shared, obviously, in Life Remixed, uh, the book. Uh, thank you, mate. Uh, what I've learned is is that um, uh, I can actually feel as good as I would like to, or as I choose to feel through study uh you know dealing with anxiety overcoming fear moving outside of comfort zones doing great things being successful i get the same buzz almost as good uh, as what i did when i just like you know took that little pill and, and went onto the dance floor and and danced the night away you know so so the point is is that you know i've dealt with my subconscious conditioning and i know you have in in many ways as well but i've dealt with that subconscious conditioning which means i no longer have the addictive behavior but when you're someone said to me once when you're the goldfish in the bowl the last thing you know about is water. And it's true. When you when we were on the day, it felt like everyone was doing it. There was hundreds of thousands of kids all out partying, all 18 to 25, 30, you know, and, and we're all out there. And it felt like everyone was doing it. And so it felt safe. And it was like how we all connected with each other and partied and, and everything else. That's that's not to say there was lots of people that were just enjoying themselves without, you know, drink and drugs or anything like that. But for me, the addictions, you know, as I say, they did take hold and they didn't serve me that well in the end, to be honest, you know. Yes, let's. I'm just showing some of your um, Instagram. I won't. I won't ask you about it. Or we'll, we'll just keep interrupting the conversation. But no, it's um, fine. I love it. I love looking back at those old photos. It's uh, it's, it's incredible. Yes. <laughs> Drinking cocktails in the bath, mate. That's. Uh, oh, that was uh, that was that was a photo shoot for my uh, huge gay fan base that I had at that time. <laughs> hey, work it, work it. I was working, I was actually working in quite a lot of gay clubs. And I remember one of the guys saying to me, he said, yeah, but you're not gay, Mark. And I was like, well, yeah, but I just play great music and everyone dances. Is that, is that not okay? And they said, yeah, well, we need a photo shoot. And uh, one of my uh, uh, girlfriends at the time said, well, why don't we do a few photos? That, and uh, one of them was me sitting in a bath with a, with a cocktail. It was hilarious. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh, house music was massive on the gay scene, wasn't it? And, uh... It came from the gay scene, as you rightly put it. You know, it came out, it came from Frankie Knuckles, who's a, a gay black man in, in America, playing this music. And it attracted a lot of gay people to the clubs. And if you go to New York, even, I'm not so sure exactly what it's like now, I haven't been for a while, but when you go to New York, certainly previously, if you said you're into house music, everyone just assumed you were gay. And it was like, well, actually, no, it's just me and 30 of my straight, slightly overweight mates uh, all going to uh, all going to this nightclub. Uh, and it's full of these beautiful gay men all dancing. But, you know, for us, house music is one beat, one one uh, thing, you know, one love for everybody. And uh, and honestly, it just it's beautiful to see when it when you see a, a house music nightclub, wherever you are in the world, New York, Miami, across Europe, into Russia and into Asia, and wherever, wherever you are, it unifies and it, it brings people together. And, and that in itself is powerful, as you say. Yes. The gayers love me, mate, I'll tell you. <laughs> Seriously, I've had my bum pinch more times than I am. Um... Then I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I, did get proposed, I did get proposed a couple of times. And I was a bit like, ah, I'm not gay, but you know, but it was great. I Mate, mean, it's yeah, we... the atmosphere, the atmosphere in gay clubs to me, when they enjoy, when gay people enjoy music, it's phenomenal. Mate. Love it. It's because we're gorgeous, mate. You know, some, well, but some, of course, some blokes have got it and you know, mo <laughs> most haven't, unfortunately, but <laughs> uh, I yes, hear you. I'm so glad you touched on that because, um, I noticed a, a big disconnect with me and my mates who got into their music, but they got into it 10 years after I did. So they were all kind of your Stone Roses yep. crew, right? And the, the Manchester, Bob Hare, you know, gobby about taking coke, that kind of, you know, Oasis, Stone Roses sort of scene. And don't get me wrong, absolutely incredible, one wonderful music. And I completely get it. But... The difference was, if you went up to one of them and 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 went to give them a hug, they'd be like, "Whoa, whoa!" And it's like they just they didn't get it, Mark, right? Mm. And they didn't get that. No, mate, we we're, we're all the same. You haven't you haven't worked it out yet because you haven't been through this amazing experience that many of us mm. did where you sit on the floor of a grungy club rolling a joint with, you know, this guy could be the, the I'm sorry to use cliches and I mean no offence, but this guy could be the, the dustbin man that your parents warned you you don't want to become. 
and then you realize actually like he's just like me and he's a really nice guy and 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 all this prejudice and class system is all completely made up to control us well, we um, we had we had pop stars we had football hooligans uh, we had uh, clubbers, we had people who worked in banks, we had the dustbin men, as you say. We had, we had everyone. And it was literally, it was just a great leveller. It was just Friday night, Saturday night, sometimes all day Sunday as well on Sunday night. But it was just that great leveller. We were all just one, you know. And, and it, it, even at 18, you know, I, 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 I was quite full of anxiety. I was drinking, I'd experimented with a lot of soft drugs and stuff like that. And when I had this moment and I was just in this club and I describe it in, in chapter two of Life Remixed, uh, which is called Good Times, Chapter Two, because there were good times, and we have to admit it. And there was there was you know good moments that we we all enjoyed. Um, but that that moment of just that uplift, and as you, you describe it actually quite well, it's almost like you know becoming like normal, um, you know, or becoming you know whatever you think normal is, and feeling good about yourself. I, I was transformed from a very nervy kind of like self conscious kind of teenager to someone who was just like prepared to dance all night with springs in his feet and and party around and chat up women and enjoy myself and have a good time. Um, and, uh, you know, that was that was quite a transformation. And it, but it was it was a leveler. You know, Margaret Thatcher often took the credit for try, for stopping football hooliganism. And there's a whole other debate about whether or not Acid House in 1988 and everyone, you know, suddenly you had Millwall and Chelsea fans and they're all together, all like cuddling on dance floors going, we'll go out for a drink in the week. You know? it's yeah, just like, it's a big game changer. Yes, you can understand. Um, I don't want to get off topic here because I know that you you know about it, but you can understand why it's used for medicinal, um, for th sorry, therapeutic purposes. Well, well if, if you were to sort of, I'm not suggesting people do. I suggest people I live their lives. I'll live mine. And I'm like quite happy about that. I'm not telling you what to do and you don't tell me what to do. Right. But if they were to, you know, neck quarter of a pinger, they soon realise all this hate and phobia and, and prejudice well, and, and it, it, it... I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things I put in Chapter 3 is that at the moment, the US uh, FDA, Food and Drug Agency in the US, they're carrying out uh, tests on MDMA to see if it helps with PTSD, to see if it helps people that are suffering with severe anxiety or severe mental health issues and stuff like that, which in itself is very, very interesting. And I believe someone told me earlier that it was um, it was used uh, in the 1950s for relationship counselling to help people with relationships, you know, and it was actually you know prescribed. So things change throughout the world, you know. And yes, you know, did, did we, you know, did we abuse it? And did yeah, of course, you know. And 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 you know, there was moments that 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 addiction, you know, really really kicked in and, and took control. Um, but the thing about it is, is that. If, if perceptions change, look at look at um, cannabis oil now and, and and stuff like that. You know, people are taking cannabis oil because they believe it's therapeutic for the body um, because it can take away chronic pain and stuff like that. There's so many things. One of the things I do, Chris, right, and I've learned this. You know, some would say the hard way, but I've learned this and I've put it in this book: is observation is power and judgment is weakness. So I observe everything that's going on around me and I have no judgments whatsoever of any individual, nobody. I just observe. I see what's going on. I'm not emotionally involved in anything that's you know, not going to serve me in a good way. And I just observe. And it's a much, much, much better place to be. We should point out you've got a lot of broken servicemen now that are going down to Central America and they're doing the ayahuasca experience. And I'm, I'm not saying it works for everybody. And I've never I've never taken ayahuasca. Um, but I do know people that just say it just changed their lives and if I can just chip in here Mark I, because we've been so uh, indoctrinated and brainwashed by what I call the sociopaths i.e. the people that just control the whole show in life they control the government they own all the corporations they control all the secret societies they you know they've got their mitts on everything they they um they and the biggest thing that people don't understand they control the money system and the the byproduct of the money system is a is is putting us all into slavery and fear mm. that's a slight aside but one of the things they want you to do is to think of a substance as an evil as that and what mark and i are talking about is not the substance per se 
it's the fact that it gives you an experience or, or, or us that allowed us to step out of the matrix True. and then view ourselves objectively and view life objectively that and I'm not gonna I, I've got to be careful what I say on YouTube so I'm um, but following on from that it, it's a real shame that in this society we always look at addiction as a negative thing because to me it's the best thing that ever happened to me and when yeah, I look I at my life now, it's taught me some valuable spent... lessons. Yeah, taught me some valuable lessons, Chris. Yeah. And I, I think you're very, very good point about fear and control. Very good point. Yeah. the The issue is, is that sadly, and we got to separate here. People overdosing. That's not about addiction. That's about the potency of of a chemical or the maybe it, w w whatever. Maybe it's been met or somebody whose tolerance is lowered and they've gone back and hit it heavy and bang they go over that that's not addiction right um but when that happens of course that's incredibly sad so what i'm saying is is that there are people that won't make it through this this tunnel called addiction there are people that will uh hurt their family damage their children um hurt themselves and i, I what i'm trying to say is it's not it it it's a fucking tightrope, right? It's a it's a road that if you, well, I had no choice, but I don't think you choose to go down it. It you find yourself in it, um, and I've I've known people, you know, I've watched mates die. I buried two mates in the last two years from addiction, um, and the point the point I'm getting to is i i don't want to dismiss that it's horrible it's a shame it's a tragedy and i i completely get it but it's also society's not set up to manage when this thing called addiction happens to people they find themselves in it and to support them through it and hopefully if there was a better way and a safer way and a more uh, a, a more practical way of quickly dealing with that childhood trauma in a in in a most pragmatic you're never going to get rid of it it's always going to be there but you can learn to manage it and learn and get your self-esteem blah 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 and just the last thing i wanted to say much sorry I'm, I'm 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 talking a lot but obviously i'm passionate about it enlightening people in this area is you know i wouldn't if you look at my life now, I'm the luckiest man on the planet. I genuinely am the luckiest man. I've got, I, you just look at my son, you will understand why. And to think that people think I've, I've lived my life in like any kind of wrong way, they're, they're absolutely mistaken. I've made all the right decisions at the right times. Uh, yeah. I, as it affected my hope, yeah, probably taking 10 years off my life, 20, I might die tomorrow, who who cares? I, I'm not bothered about that, but what the, the point is, is uh, like I live in paradise, and, and so why are we still looking at people with mental, who have mental, as a negative thing? You know, I mean, obviously, as an example, it can be catastrophic, not, not saying that's not, and having a permanent mental illness that that plagues you or comes and go that is it's terribly terribly sad there's a but those are the extremes you're describing there of course yeah yes. there, there's lots of people that are not that in in that far extreme but one of the things i wrote down in life remix towards the end of the book when i, I got married you know and i managed to finally have a successful relationship and everything which was a joy after so many uh unsuccessful successful attempts but the remedy to addiction is connection but you have to start with yourself. Always, always, always start with yourself. So you have to find that connection within yourself. And you mentioned about luck. Now, to me, I, I don't necessarily believe in luck. For me, it's about the law of attraction. And what you learn about yourself and then put out into the world is what comes back to you. So people might look at you and go, well, that's really lucky. You've got a beautiful life, a home life, a son, and everything else. But actually, 
you attracted that into your life in a good way to for you to keep learning, keep growing. And every day is a school day. We're all here to learn, to grow, to to get really, really to to a great place. And one of my mentors, Bob Proctor, says that uh, many people are just creeping through life, hoping they get safely to death. And that's not being alive, right? That's not really being alive and experiencing some of the things that we're talking about here and then being able to learn from them and grow them and coach with other people. And the last thing I wanted to say as well is that there's a great quote from um, The Shawshank Redemption, which I'm sure you know is a film. It's a wonderful (coughs) film. He says, get busy living or get busy dying. Yes. Uh, and that's a beautiful quote, you know, it's, you know, we I'm here with you, Chris, cause we're getting busy living, right? <laughs> yeah. And you've got another quote, mate. Sorry. I get a bit distracted when I'm, I'm, I'm a typical man. Don't apologize. My girlfriend will, will remind me with great pleasure how I can't multitask and I have to agree with her, I'm afraid, but I'm just going to get that picture of uh, Andy Dufresne up. Yes. Yeah, brilliant picture. Um, there's another quote here. Uh, who crawled through a river of shit and came out clean on the other side. And I, honestly, that's kind of how I feel about my early part of my life, which is why I've written Life Remix, because I do genuinely feel that river of shit was essentially anxiety, doubt, fear, worry, addictions. You know, yes. that was that I was making my life. I was making my life a bit of a living hell. And you made a beautiful description about how you live in like a nice heavenly kind of utopia now. Well, that's how I feel. And there's a poignant moment at the end of that film where he swum through the sewer. He gets out the other side. He's finally free after 30 years of like feeling this like, you know, or in prison as it is in the film. And I feel that was like a mental prison for me. You know, I came out the other side and went, oh, OK, let's go. You know, and uh, it feels good. It feels great. And, and that's what coaching is about. That's what we do with Life Remix Coaching and all the other stuff that I'm involved in. It's just sharing that with people because I want people to feel good. Mark, we'll come on to that. But yeah. I, I would be gutted if I let you go without asking you some of the kind of more nitty gritty questions that I, I've got the do chance it. to ask a world class DJ. Do it. Um, so, and I don't want to put them in any sort of order. So substances over bloody, Go for the, it. The, you know, the music's obviously most important, but yeah. just, so there you are, right? Uh, I don't mean you in particular, but you're, there's, there's all, all our world-class DJs. We all know all the, the names. Some of them were quite um, upfront about the fact they never dabbled in anything. I think some of them didn't even drink and not surprising their longevity. They outlasted most. <laughs> I think they're still at many. Then there was the, those that went through the mill. Then they had their enlightenment or their, I, I don't like to use the word recovery, but everyone knows yeah. what, 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 what I mean. You don't, I don't think you recover from an experience. You just, you should learn by it. But anyway, they go on to then, have a, a a sort of second career completely substance free but when you're that young guy you're 25 30 whatever and you you you're off to new york or like the way my mind would work was how can i get some stuff when i get there right i'm not going to ad- say that i i take stuff on airplanes because that makes me sound like a, a criminal but you know, I'm, I'm, I've put a lot of thought into this, Mark, is what I'm saying. How is it? Um, I mean, for example, I'm not going to say a name, but a certain person rocked up in a place I was abroad and he had a minder that, that they hired a local minder to look after him. He's a top kickboxing guy. And that place just happened to have the, the best Charlie, like, in the world and i think one of this guy's jobs was to <laughs> bring a bag to the airport so to speak so can you enlighten us on that that sort well, of thing all, all i would say all i would say is there was no shortage of anything there was no short and and, and actually that's something i've brought into my later life with, with everything that i'm doing with life remix there's no shortage of anything you know at the end of the day whatever you think about is what you bring about so if, when i was in that world of addiction and music and sex, drugs and house music and all the other stuff that was going on. There was no shortage of anything. None, no, nothing. You know, I could go anywhere in the world and there'd be like-minded people like me who wanted to dance to my music, but also by the law of attraction and the law of vibration, whatever I put out 
came back to me. So people would like, you know, just you know, supplement my addictions wherever I was in the world. Um, you know, because generally I'd be around other people who were also addicted to certain things as well. And and it, yeah, it could be sex, drugs, and house music, like I said. So, you know, it was uh, when I say that we all it all it felt like everyone was doing it anywhere in the world. Sixty five countries I've been around the globe, all kinds of stuff. And uh, yeah, there was there was party. Party central for everybody, however you wanted it, wherever you wanted it, whatever you And being the DJ, I had a promoter say to me once, Mark, if you're happy, I'm happy. And he's the promoter. And I was like, okay, yeah, now we're talking. <laughs> yes, it, it must put a, a sort of awful pressure on you when you're trying to um, put that, that lifestyle behind you when people keep coming up and going, there you go, mate. It, it, it was, was that a, is that a difficult thing to manage? It was massively interesting. So I basically my the story is in life remix. The first three chapters are my story. Then the rest of the book is how I did recover, how I regained, how I learned, what I learned, and then it's for any other person who's having any kind of struggle at the moment. I mean, this book is basically about recovering from a crisis, right? Uh, recovering from a crisis. It's about that. And, you know, hey, here we are in a global crisis. Here's this book. Read it. You, you'll find some interesting stuff. I gave up alcohol one day on a detox in Scotland with a, a mentor of mine. He said to me, why do you drink, Mark? I was like, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, because everybody does, because I've been doing it since I was 14. I don't know why I drink alcohol. I just do. Because what I, I what I'd spoken to him about was alcohol was the start point, and it just went on like a house of cards from there. And my night would just collapse into madness, you know, and, and late night phone calls and all sorts of stuff. Uh, when I started drinking alcohol, so he said to me, "Why do you drink?" I was like, "I don't know." Long story short, he called me out a couple of times because I was just flanneling about stuff. He was like, "Bullshit!" He's like, "Don't tell me that you know you're just making these stories up about." One of my stories was the reason I drink is because other people buy me drinks. He said to me, no way. He was like, no, he wasn't having any of it. He was a great guy. He's a great guy. He's still a friend, Brian Miller. He's actually in the book and everything. Great, fantastic man. He called me out. I was 35. I was in pain. My body was giving me pain. I'd collapsed once. I had an incurable disease in my body. You know, I was, my body was screaming at me to listen. And Brian finally just went to me, why do you drink alcohol? Went through this process with him. I made the decision there and then. It was a Wednesday. I went for a detox in the middle of the week. On the Saturday night, I'd been playing in a club. And the following Saturday night, I was actually back at Ministry of Sound. And on the Wednesday, on this detox, I said, I'm not going to drink alcohol anymore. That's it. I'm done. 14 to 35, borderline alcoholic. I'm done. And I went back to the club in answer to your question. I went back to the club on the Saturday afterwards. And here's the thing. I expected 95 or 100% of the people to try, try and buy me a drink. And when I said, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not drinking alcohol anymore. I've just, just made a decision. I expected them to be like, hey, wanker, come on, come on, have a drink, come on. You know, because that was kind of what I expected them to do, right? That was the expected thing. Come on, get involved, do this, do that. I'm telling you now, 99% of the people that night, I'll never forget it. That night, I was playing at Ministry, people offering me drinks, all sorts, you know, come on, get involved, get, have a drink, you know, do this party time, whatever. I said, no, thank you. I'm all right. I don't, I don't drink anymore. I've, I'm tidying up my act now. I've got to listen to my body. It's time to change. Almost to a, I want to say to a man, almost to a person, male and female, they said to me, I wish I could do that. I'm so glad you said that, Mark, because um, two things. One, I... What, one, I've been trying to promote um, this group called One Year No Beer because it's a great thing to do. If you're having problems, get on the one. I, I never actually did the... I didn't realise it was a course. I thought it was a hashtag, right? I, it's just one of those stupid... The the way my mind works at times is, is I'm not the smartest cookie in the box. So okay. I thought you just declare to your mates, I'm doing One Year No Beer. So that's yeah. what I did. Yeah. And... You know, I, I, I drank and took drugs every day for 30 years, right? Uh, I remember getting on your 12 can of strong lager and thinking, oh, I've got to work in five hours. You know, it was, it was, it's just, I'm not going to knock it. Like I say, to me, it was all just experiences. I won't say it was always sensible and it was always good, but um, so I was quite, 
I, I think I hit a rock bottom with it all because it's bad. You know, alcohol and families just shouldn't be... If, if you're a problematic drinker, mm. it, it, you, you have to address your behaviour. And so when I become a father, it became a thing that, that I needed to address. And I'm yeah. not... Per I haven't been perfect at it and I don't want people to think it's that easy. But, but I did do the one year no beer and then I did another year. And now I just cho choose not to drink because life is just so much better without it. I, I, people either understand that or, or, or one, one of my friends, one of my friends would call your would call your son nature's handbrake. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, if we if we put the sins on our own kids that we had done to us, well, then you're just passing it. You're, on. you're a coward and you're a hypocrite. And I don't. I, I, we are all human, guys. You know what? I've never done any of this sort of twelve step. Mark, I, I, it's not my thing. Um, I would recommend it if you had a massive problem and you had children and you tried everything else. And I've done the let's just work it out bit by bit as the years go by, and 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 it, and I've got quite a strong mind off the back of that. I think one of the things is is that we naturally come to this kind of uh, realization as we go through life. One of the reasons I've used coaches and I'm now a coach myself is because a coach can get you there quicker. A coach, a mentor, someone can get you there quicker. So rather than you taking years and years and years to work something out, someone confronting you a little bit or someone challenging you a little bit or someone like giving you goals and visions and purpose and get you moving, that actually accelerates it. And, and I was, thankfully, I was smart enough, even though I wasn't really aware of it, I was smart enough to look for help and listen. Uh, and once I looked for help and started to listen, I started to make these changes. So all the stuff we're talking about and all the stuff we talk about, and it's in our books and all the YouTube ch channels and videos and everything we do, it's just about trying to reach a few extra people each time and just go, look, you know, this has worked for me. Why don't you try it? And, and you know, if that can help these people that are suffering, and there are people suffering in the world, you know, suicide rates are shooting up in different parts of the world for different reasons. You know, I work in the construction sector quite a lot. Again, um, you know, uh, suicide rates are too high, far too high in, uh, in construction workers. You know, if we can just help people a little bit more and go, here, listen to this. this, this could be something. And I've got various tools and things that I work with that I know are proven to work in different industries at different times. Just let's just do, you know, that's my life mission. My life mission is to help people not make the mistakes that I made uh, and potentially get them to where they want to get to quicker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd even go as far as to say it's like make the mistakes, but I just want to be there to kind of like get you to the realisation yeah. point quicker because yeah. it took me, like I say, 30 years to find paradise. And I'm glad I did because... That meant I found it at, at forty-five-ish, yeah. and I'll meet if I've got. You've got time to enjoy it, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I've got another thirty years left, I, I've got thirty years in paradise. And, and let's be honest, yeah, most lovely. people will never get there. Yeah. Well, some I, people there can be nothing sadder. I, I guess that you know people get into their deathbed or or their or even just their rocking chair and thinking to themselves, I could have done that really differently. If only I'd listened or if only I'd studied, if only I'd changed. You yeah, know. and they do. I've told this story before. I've had a grown man crying on me when I was backpacking in, in down in Oz. Well, Chris, I listened to your live and I've, I've fucked mine up, mate. I've just, I went for the house and the car and the new job position and I've, I've basically, you know, job slave or, or, or yeah. Yeah. fine folks. If you love your job, I'm, I'm, I'm actually envious of you. It's Can just I that. Can I, can I show you something? I like to do this on my courses because I do these five days to remix your life uh, courses, right? Which I run for free online at the moment um, throughout the week. For each month we do it. If anyone wants to join, you're welcome. But let, let's do this, Chris. This is fun, right? Can you watch the screen? Yeah, can you see, can you see what I'm doing, right? So the average UK salary is what? Should we say 40,000? I mean, you know, I don't get sort of 30,000 a year. Mate, I make less than 10 grand a year. So you, you're asking the wrong person. Let's just go. Let's just go with forty grand a year for a salary that people might earn, right? Okay, as an average. All right, we can even do less actually. All right, now let's do thirty thousand. Thirty thousand pounds is an average UK salary. It's somewhere in there. But if we divide that by twelve months of the year, you've got two thousand five hundred, right? If we divide that uh, by four point three weeks uh, of the uh, of the month, 
that comes out as 581 pounds a week, right? So let's just say 580, 580 pounds a week. Uh, and then we divide that by how many hours people work? 45 hours in an average job, possibly. If we divide that by 45, that's 12 pounds 88 an hour. My cleaner, 12 pounds 50. I love her. She's incredible, right? Beautiful woman, cleans my house beautifully every two weeks. £12.50 an hour I pay her. But the, someone on the average UK salary of £30,000 a year is not earning very... In fact, after tax, he'll be earning less. So, you know, we've got to look at this. We've got to look at this with a bit more wisdom. We've got to study a few books that are out in the world and like learn from people that are doing something in a different way that actually moves you outside of that job slate. You know, my business coach and mentor, uh, Kevin Green, who studied with Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, Kevin says job stands for just over broke because that's where it's going to keep you. So start to think outside the box and study with a few people. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, The Rich Rules by Kevin Green, Life Remix by Mark Wilkinson. Think about this stuff and then get out there and actually make changes. Yes, definitely. Just going back to the D, I'm going to just... Keep going, mate. I'm just going to try and find a photo. I've got a photo of me with Tony Robbins here somewhere. I'm not quite oh, have you? Brilliant. I love it. Yeah. Uh, well, I look for that. So, okay, next question. Did it get, like, annoying or kind of how did you deal when you get the sort of sycophantic or should we say group groupies, isn't it? Groupies. What? Yeah, well, I mean, look, you know, for me... Um, for me, as a young DJ with a slightly rampant ego, um, I, I, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't praise me enough, right? If you want to praise me and put me on a pedestal, great, thanks, you know? I would love it uh, because ultimately that made, me, that made my ego feel good. Okay, the ultimate thing here, and I know you're reading through the book, the ultimate thing here when you get to it is that I didn't like me very much. I didn't like me very much. So... But if you liked me, so if, if the crowd, thousand people at Ministry of Sound or Pasha Ibiza, or if a thousand people liked me, I must be all right. Yeah. If the woman in my life praised me and put me on a pedestal and thought I was amazing, then I must be all right. You know, and this and then, you know, the addictions took the pain away and all that other kind of stuff, the self-medication that I was doing and everything else. But the real skill of this was that, you know, that's not what it's about. You know, in fact, I've studied a lot about the masculine and the feminine in, in relationships. And I do this in my relationship section of my course. Relationships, masculine and feminine. And by the way, we're all made up of mum and dad 50-50. So it's not about man and woman. It's about masculine and feminine within every one of us. But I heard a great thing that the feminine part of us grows through praise and the masculine part of us grows through um, uh, challenge. Uh, and you think about that, masculine men, they all want to challenge, don't they? And, you know, run up hills and do it, you know. But, you know, you've got to understand that part of yourself that is masculine and feminine. And my feminine was raging out of control. I was brought up by my mum. My dad died when I was a kid. Brought up by my mum. I wanted praise. The feminine part of me was like, praise me, praise me, praise me. So groupies and, and lots of other people around, oh, I loved it. I was like, great. Everyone's there to praise Mark. Isn't he a wonderful DJ? Fed, fed right into what I needed. Got you. All right, next question. Can you get, tell us about some random after parties? <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna chip in my little anecdote yeah, if I it, may. Um, this is in, um, this is in uh, uh, homage, if that's the right word, to to my mate Andy. Rest in peace. But Andy. After the warehouse kicked out, it's interesting you say it's called the warehouse because obviously the club in, in Plymouth, Plymouth was. was I used to DJ in there. I used to DJ in there a lot in Plymouth. Yeah, I've just put, been putting some photos of the warehouse on the screen. So, um, but after warehouse kicked out at two in the morning, we all jumped in the car and we headed to this um, illegal ray. I say illegal. I mean they're not illegal, are they? But the government makes them makes up these makes the law up as they go along but we headed to this rave and it was in a repossessed um hotel uh, it was about 10 miles outside the city and we're going down all these back lanes everyone was, well the car was basically a hot box and then a, a copper pulled out in front of us Andy's driving he's got no he didn't even, he wasn't even British didn't have a British license didn't have any, the car had no insurance no MOT and everyone's like, Andy, Andy, cops, cops. And he went, 
yeah, fuck that, man. I'm going to follow them. They must know where the party's at. <laughs> <laughs> and he followed this police car up its bumper. And, we're, right. and we got to this party, went up to the door, and the, the guy on the door's like, quid for the DJ, lads. And he's like, fuck that, man. We just left here five minutes ago. Didn't you see us? And he went, oh, sorry, fellas. <laughs> right. Let us in for free. Sorry that we uh, denied the DJ community a quid, but... Well, it is what it is, mate. <laughs> and, um, yes, it, it was it was an eye-opener. It, it was a, a country house that had obviously been quite some place in its day, and there were people lounging around on sort of um, those posh armchairs and, and, and all this. It was... It, it were people skinning up on the ironing board, and, and it was just... A, like a hedonistic paradise. Um, so yeah, that's my story, Mark. I bet you've got a few. Hey, I've got loads. I've I literally just, I was listening, of course, but I, I always find it easier to sort of write stuff down to remind me of what I would like to say when it's in my mind. Yeah. Uh, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that have just come straight into my mind. So I'll, I'll rattle them off like a machine gun and just go. Uh, the first one, uh, you mentioned Hong Kong. Uh, first one I DJed at a club in Hong Kong uh, called I think it's called Westworld or something like that. They did the dentist chair on me where uh, they you know took three people to do. I was laying back and someone was pouring drinks into me. Someone else is setting fire to it. I'm drinking it all down uh, and I remember standing there and I just to come off a 14 hour flight of a seven hour time difference and I took had this drink and I was like whoop hang on a minute. And I was like, my neck muscles felt like they were giving way. And I was like, I need to get up. I need to, this is a big mistake. You live in Hong Kong. I'm going to pop outside for a breath of fresh air. Oh, that was a big mistake. So I, I walked outside, my glasses steamed up and I was just collapsed on the side of the pavement because it's like about 35 degrees and like 90% humidity. So that was an interesting one. Another one in Leeds. I remember someone said, let's go to an after party. And we ended up in this after party after a club night in Leeds uh, that was basically in a farm. Uh, we were just in the middle of this farmyard, you know, with chickens and pigs and all sorts running around. And, you know, it was very, very, very surreal. Very surreal. Um, another one, someone got me in Cornwall once for an after party and they said, we're going to this other party. It's just down the road. Just down the road in Cornwall means about 40 miles away, right? It was literally, I was just down the road. I was like, we're driving for like about an hour. I'm like, where are we going, you know? Um, uh, some other beauties. Um Clerkenwell, where I used to live, right opposite Turn Mills. We used to have after parties in the flat there. I remember coming back from nightclubs and there was 12 flats in the building of which six people were like party, party people. And I remember walking and we, we were walking up the stairs at the end of a club, club night. And we were heading for bed, me and my, me and my fiance at the time, we we're heading for bed. And all we could hear was, dum, 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 dum. I was like, hold on a minute, hold on. I think there's a party in flat four. So we went in and just, I, went, I opened the door and there's about 150 people in this party. I'm like, right, let's go. Next thing you know, it's like 10 o'clock in the, anyway, that was all mad. And lots of other ones, Junior Boys Own or Boys Own did parties at East Grinstead, uh, which was uh, an incredible all nighter. We saw the sun uh, go down and the moon come up and then the sun come up again on this same uh, lake, which was just spiritual at like 18 or 19. Um, and then the Didcot's, uh, Jude, uh, did cop party called respect at the steam museum or oh, some of these stories are in the book by the way so in the first part of life remix i've had a, quite a few people say to me thanks for the trip down memory lane because they're remembering stuff going like wow yeah i was there or i remember that or that or that so all these things are just but i literally just asked me the question and that all just flowed out right but uh there's so many of it there might be another book in this we'll see <laughs> quick question then which sort of celebs have you hobnob with oh that's a good one uh, or boy face, faces let's not use that horrible word but you... oh, i hear you i hear you uh boy george comes straight to mind um and then you'd have people like well, all, all the djs i mean if you say if you say mark wilkinson to djs i had a text from fat boy slim yesterday saying how much he loves life remixed as a book you know so uh so that was nice to get that from from norman cook he's um, um he he keeps texting me trying to borrow a tenner <laughs> i've had to, i've had to, no, block I've blocked you, all right? <laughs> stop stop it. Brilliant, stop bothering me. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, you know, all, lots of, all the famous DJs, you know, I mean, your Murillo's, your Peak Tongs, all these kind of other DJs. All the junior boys own lot, of course, that I've worked with with Rocky and Terry Farley. Um, you know, just, just really, really cool people um, that I've enjoyed spending time with. 
um, and have really committed their life to music. So there's a lot of that, obviously. Uh, Boy George, certainly. I remember Boy George dancing to me all night at Pasha in Ibiza one night, uh, and that was great. I've reached out to him, actually, and said, uh, does he want to have a chat about the book and stuff like that? Um, yeah, so many people, mate, so many. Um, I'm sure more will come to mind as I go through it. But but the bottom line is, is that we're all people. We're all one. We're all dancing to music. We've all got our own journey we've all got our own trials and tribulations you know and just because someone makes it more successfully in a certain area doesn't make them any better or or or, or any worse than anyone else you know it's uh, it's all part of our journey right i want to hear about the women mark come on don't hold back i want uh, details well I'm, I'm a specky slightly chubby at times uh chap um and i uh i used uh i used music as my way of attracting women basically uh, and uh, I was not the best boyfriend uh, to many women. Uh, I didn't know myself, let alone how to how to work in a in a loving relationship. Um, and uh, yeah, I kept going in and out of relationships. I'd have one or two year relationships, but the thing was, I was always hungry for the next you know, the next relationship or the next girl or, or whatever, you know, and it was it wasn't nice. It was that's not a nice that's not a nice way to be. But I was misguided. I was misguided. My mum couldn't teach me that stuff and my dad had died. Um, and I just, I didn't know. I've had to learn masculinity as I've got older uh, because when I was younger, yeah, there was, there was a lot of women. I mean, my current wife often asks me, uh, so, so what's your number? And I'm like, I'm not going, I'm not going there. It's not, that's not happening. We're not, we're not having that conversation yeah. because I wasn't the best young man. Do you know uh, one of my old muckers from Hong Kong, Lee Burridge? I know Lee really well. Lee Lee got me out there. Lee and Tim Fagg and a lot of the other guys, they were the ones that got me out there to DJ. I went twice. Um, hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. Yeah, Lee gets I've gave, given him a mention in my in my my book. Look, I'll promote my book now. Look, that's or one of them, I should say. That's my first memoir. Oh wow. Eating Smoke, One Man's Descent into Crystal Meth Psychosis in Hong Whoa. Kong's Triad Heartland. Wow, amazing. And it was in that triad heartland that um, I was chatting to a chap on the dance floor and uh, he, he told me his name was Lee, Lee Burridge, and he was over there trying to make it as a DJ. Yep. And he said, you want a beer, Chris? I said, yeah, I'd love... i tell you that, when, you, when you're a bit nutted on crystal meth, that Corona or that Soul, I can't remember which one it was, with a lime in, done half go down well. So um, yeah, he bought me a beer, and um, years later, of course, he's now, uh, well, one of the world's leading DJs. Oh, he's done brilliantly well. Yeah, absolutely. He hooked up with Sasha. He, you know, he used to take DJs out there. He took me out there, as I say, a couple of times, Lee, and, and we had some great gigs. It was brilliant. I, I always remember ending up in the after party in Hong Kong at the Big Apple. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> da, da, da. <laughs> it's all in there you're going to hear what, it in here as well mate you're going to hear a few bits in there what, as well what year what year 94 was that, 94 definitely um, and then maybe the year after 95 something like that oh man that was um, I was then I was then 95 and 96 I think it was okay there you go um, so if you remember the Big Apple mate we know what we're talking about oh here. mate I I only really went in the Big Apple my my mate um Roy, who's Ray Ray in my book, um, the ex squaddy, he was the manager in there. Okay. Um, Frank, he was the triad big brother that ran the place. Um, I was worked on the door across the road club. I call Club Nemo in my book. Um, that was run by the 14K triads as well. Um, I was on the. It was another club. I was on the door of a club called Rick's Cafe one night. And um, no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a very quick anecdote. I'm going home from work one day as a, as, as a doorman. There's a guy pacing up flyers. I said, hello, mate, how much you get paid for doing that? He went, oh, nothing, I'm a promoter. I, I you know, do, do this for myself. He said, have you heard of Brandon Block and Alex P? And back then... I used to love the music, but I wasn't really that familiar with names and that sort of stuff. So yeah. I said, no, nah, mate, I'm not. Um, he said, oh, best DJ in the world. at Brandon's best DJ in the world at the minute, mate, right? Obviously, he's a promoter, so he's, he's, yeah, 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 it's, yeah. it's a good good thing to say. But um, 
And then when I went to work the next day, all the boys behind the bar were like, Chris, you going to see Brandon and Alex on Saturday night? I'm like, I think I've got to. I just, I keep hearing about these guys from everybody. Um, so I was out later that night in a club and, it, and in Hong Kong, you go out all night. Clubs are open, as you, as you know, Mark, yeah, all yeah, night. Yeah. Yeah. Come the next day, the two guys I was with, they both left and I was having a beer um, in a club. I think it was called Carnegie's, if I remember rightly. Might have been somewhere else. And um, and I had a tie on because the mate that, that I used to go out with worked in an Italian restaurant and every time he finished work, he had his tie on from work. So one of those stupid things you do when you're young for no looking back, like why, is I thought <laughs> I'd ditch my dicky bow and I'll put like a normal tie on in, in, in honour of my mate. So I'm there at this club. Um, I'm, I'm there in this bar at, at 10 a.m. in the morning or whatever. And, and uh, this girl starts having a go at me going, what you got a fucking tie on for? You look like you look fucking stupid. And then this geezer that I'd seen out, I'd seen him out in a few clubs the night before. It just turned around and went, mate. Any time you want to wear a toy, you wear a fucking toy. <laughs> and I said, oh, thank you, mate. I'm Chris. He said, Brandon, mate. Brandon Block. <laughs> He's a top fella, Blocko. He's a lovely guy. I've got another little story for you as well, actually. I got so drunk in uh, in Hong Kong. Those boys, you know, uh, Lee and the rest of the time, I got so drunk. It was it was it was savage. I remember going to the following morning. This is how classy I was. Uh, the following morning, well, probably lunchtime. The following day, I went to a McDonald's in uh, in Hong Kong. We walked down to get like the McDonald's breakfast or whatever, and I got an orange juice and I got me a little burger and everything. And I wasn't. It wasn't going to go down very well, and it was. It didn't end well. But the bit of the, the funny bit of the story is, uh, I was drinking this. I was drinking this McDonald's orange juice and I was with the, with a mate, a guy that was there to look after me sort of thing. I went, that's got vodka in it. And I swore, I swear to God, this McDonald's orange juice was full of vodka. I was going, I was like, can you taste that? Can you smell it? I was, honestly, I was, I was so <laughs> polluted with, oh dear. I mean, you know, I, you can laugh about it, but there was, yeah, there was some crazy moments. <laughs> Favourite house track, mate? Oh, 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 I've been playing uh, online DJ mixes on Mixcloud throughout lockdown for, for everybody. Um, and I've been playing um, some wonderful music for four or five hours a night on a Saturday night. Uh, so as to pick one. Oh, but actually, the, the one that's coming into my mind consistently for the last since you mentioned about house, uh, about pianos and everything else, it's uh, Marshall Jefferson and the house music anthem, um, Move Your Body and the big pianos and everything. Really great track. Then, then that would just lead me into like Byron Stingley and all 10 City, right back to You Devotion, all those big vocals. And, and hey, listen, don't get me started, mate. We'll be off, we'll be off on hours for that one. <laughs> oh, mate, I'll tell you what, I've been really enjoying lately. Um, and it comes because I watched. I rewatched that film, Rise of a Foot Soldier. Okay. About the uh, Rettenden Essex boys' murders. Oh, yeah. And um, when they cut, when, when they're in sort of narrating a new scene in that film, they, they play this track. Is it, is it Carrier? Let oh, me love you for tonight. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, din din din. Oh, I'm not even going to try and. Yeah, yeah, don't sing it, but I know what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> I'm not going to make a fool of myself, but it's got this real kind of like riff that, 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 that just. It almost sticks in your head like an earworm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember it very, very well. Sorry, just push, push the wrong buttons. Look, I was a DJ. Easily done, mate. Easily done. I got the job as DJ in the biggest nightclub in southern China, believe it or not. Okay, nice. And when I went for the interview, they you have to go there from Hong Kong on a boat, right? And uh, I called up. Roy and I said, Roy, I've got an interview in China for a DJ in this club. It's huge. It's like a million, millions of dollars venture between the government and local businesses and, and organised crime and all this stuff. I said, can I go into the Big Apple and, and write down the names of the tracks? Because I dance them every night, but I don't I don't know what they're called, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah, Chris, go for it. So I went in the Apple 
and I'm in a DJ box and the Filipino, they have Filipino bands in Hong Kong in the first part of the evening. The Filipino band is playing and then they stopped playing and they went, over to you. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, and the, the DJ wasn't there. So I gingerly, I put the, put the headphones on on one ear, worked out how to, you know, get this, this deck spinning. I could hear it in this area and I, and I could, and I just basically worked out the slider, you know, between A and B. I've got this knob here, A, A, A and B between the, the decks. So I just went for it and everyone jumped up and started dancing and like, yeah. <laughs> and um, so my DJ career kind of started accidentally. The first mix went really, really well. The second one sounded like a herd of Mustangs falling down the stairs. Um, <laughs> a herd of three-legged Mustangs <laughs> falling oh, down a flight of stairs. Oh, some pans, yeah, yeah. Someone falling down the stairs, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I went for the interview in China and I just basically blagged it. I got up on stage. I got everyone sort of clapping and doing handstands and, and, and just sort of being a bit, um, a bit outgoing. And... Um, Cut a long story short, I lost the job within within a week or two because they were advertising for a DJ. So I'm thinking like what you do, right? Take the crowd up, bring them down. No, what they meant is they wanted an MC, you know, like a but like a Butlin's red coat type yeah, yeah, person. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, rock. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I've got. I've, sorry, I've got a funny little story for you about that as well. Because everyone talks about like the the big moments, like the mo the moments of like a thousand people in Pasha or Ministry of Sound. And yeah, yeah, it was great. I've got an opposite one for you as well. I got booked on a Ministry of Sound tour in Dubai. I went over there. I went on. I started. To, it was, the club was packed, but a guy was playing like you know, like not the sort of music. And I said to the promoter, I said, "Are you sure you want me to play like?" Ministry of Sound house music here right now because I'm not sure this is going to happen. You know, I'm not sure this is going to go well. You know, you've got a packed club, you know, thousand people in here. It's all good, you know. And he went, no, 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 no. You must, you must. You play a house. You play, you play your music. Play. I'm like, all right then. So I went on. Oh, literally, the guy's record ran out, and I went boom, 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 on with the house music. I'm not joking. It was like the part. Literally, the dance floor just disappeared, and everybody sat down everybody sat down if there wasn't seats they left and i cleared this club within like six minutes <laughs> like literally I, and the guy came back to me he went uh do you have any arabic music i'm like of course i don't <laughs> why would you ask me that do I, of course i don't he went uh uh and i played another one and he was like oh maybe i said i was like mate i, I could have told you this one yeah you know i mean i could see how this was gonna go but yeah anyway listen it's all part of the fun right can i um can I ask you about Avicii? Sure. Did you ever meet him? No, he's like a different generation, probably 20, 20 years younger than me. Yeah. But, uh, you know, fascinating story uh, and, and you know, difficult choice that, you know, the, the guy was obviously being, you know, worked and working hard and he was obviously passionate about music and he wanted to be successful. Um, and I don't know, I'm not close enough to the story, but obviously I know, I know about the suicide, of course. And, um, it's, it's, it's a shame. Do you think it was suicide or, or is it that? that, that oh, okay. that... Well, I don't, I don't even know that to be honest, hundred percent. I believe that, um, the music industry, if you're not careful, um, can pick you up, rinse you out and then sling you out the, sling you out the back door. Um, and, um, I never had that level of success to that point where I was like the, the superstar. I used to see some of the DJs have that superstar status and you've got to be very, very strong willed, I think at that point to, to survive. I mean, I mean, the, more recently as well, Eric Murillo, I mean, the sad demise of Eric Murillo in, in only like, like last year or whenever it was, um, you know, potential suicide, I believe, you know, after, after various you know accusations around him and stuff like that really just just sad it's really really sad to see anyone um have a demise for, especially one of the things i've learned and this is from the life coaching and stuff from bob proctor and everything else if you show me someone who gets very very excited i'll show you the same person who can get very very depressed yeah and you can be up and down and up and down and up and down and imagine like, you know, I mean, I had that to an extent up and down, up and down, up and down, but I wasn't being adulated by 30,000 people, but I also wasn't in the depths, depths, depths of depression, but that I was up and down, up and down, up and down. And 
one of the things I've learned is to be enthusiastic about everything and happy and grateful and here and being positive and not be on that huge roller coaster of like, you know, exhilarating highs, but savage, savage lows. Yeah, he used to hit it hard, didn't he? And his body took a toll. But so I think something, when you get signed up with it by these major record labels, personally, I think it all starts going a bit dark. You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful. I mean, I, I, some, I love, you know, I love comedies, obviously, to watch to lift my spirit. But I also love, doc, love, I love watching documentaries. Uh, and one of the saddest ones, I suppose, really, is uh, Amy Winehouse, the, the, the documentary just called Amy. Um, and you see, you know, how successful she was, how incredibly talented she was, but how the self-destruct button came in and how, uh, how at times people... Uh, acted out of self-interest for their own um, benefits rather than actually for her, you know, to her, for her to recover, perhaps. Yeah, of course. When I think of everything I've been through to try and find my answers, and then I think someone like Amy has all of what I've been through, but it's all in the spotlight and it's all on the front page of every tabloid. It's it's just criminal, isn't it? The way we treat people in this society and and well, here's the thing though. I heard you say something this morning. I watched one of your short short videos on Twitter, uh, and you said if you want to be happy, you need to switch off mainstream media, uh, and then switch off mainstream media, and switch off mainstream media. And I I, I hear you with that uh, absolutely. The thing the thing with the media is that um, we are the cause and they are the effect. So. Uh, the reason that uh, viewing figures all shoot up when there's something negative on the TV, we all tune in, right? So if if their viewing figures go up where they stick Amy Winehouse on the front cover or a member of the Royal Family or anyone who's in the spotlight, Princess Diana, their viewing figures go up or their sales go up, they're going to keep doing it. We are the problem because we then go and buy it. You know, If we're buying it or purchasing it or switching it on, then that makes them do more of it. And someone who's talented as Amy Winehouse with as many issues as as many problems, she was just like, she was cannon fodder. You know, they were just all over. And, and you know, as you say, you think to, to your own mistakes and the things that you've done that, you know, you don't want that plastered all over the, all over the 24 hour news and stuff like that. You know, you've got to, you've got to find yourself and find your own mistakes in your own way and then recover them. You've got no chance if you've got a reporter with a long lens trying to check on every little thing you're doing when you're like 25. It's just, it's, I mean, horrific. Yes. Uh, but, but, you know, it's so sad. As a society, so sad. We need to tune into the Good News Network or tune into, or tune into you, Chris, or, or me. You know what I mean? We need to tune into people with a more positive message that, um, that, that can then like, lift people up. Because if you put on the news, 24 hour news, there's some, there's some dark stuff that's reported on there that you do not need to know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just really simple for me. It's the mouthpiece of the sociopaths. So if you want sociopaths who possess no empathy, their life is just about power, and they probably don't even know why, if you want them to control you, then watch their media, because they own all of it. Don't tune you know? into it. They yes. own all I, of I, it. They... I believe going to negativity fast. So switch in. If it doesn't serve you, it doesn't make you feel happy, it doesn't add money into your pocket, it doesn't do something good for you, switch it off. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, I had a question in my mind then. So the minute, uh, right. No, this question first. How is it then when you got, um, I remember when CD decks came out and it was, there was that big, oh, I'm never going to use them. It always comes out on vinyl and all this, sort of, all this stuff that you know is in 10 years, all that's going to be horseshit. Everyone's going to be using them because you have to. Then it, of course, went to laptops, didn't it? You just can hit it up on your laptop, and you can get you can get an auto queuing software that that does it all for what. I think I can speak for every traditionalist that you're never going to be two Technics decks and vinyl for the traditional uh, the traditional authentic experience. But how do you? What's your views on all of this and how has it affected your career, Mark? Well, what's interesting is, is that um, as far as technology goes, you don't get a vote on it. It's happening anyway. So uh, you either go with it or you don't. Um, when I see people DJing off laptops, it makes me think that they're checking their emails. Uh, and, I, and I just feel a bit like, nah, that's not really for me. 
Um, but what was interesting was vinyl, obviously I worked in a record shop, so it was all about vinyl for the first five, 10 years of my DJ career. Then it moved into CDs. And I remember using CD decks for like brand new music rather than cutting acetate vinyl. Uh, which was like a temporary vinyl. So I, wasn't, I wouldn't cut a temporary vinyl, I'd just record it onto CD. So I'd be playing my vinyls and then promos and, and hot stuff that was brand new, I'd be playing off CDs. Um, and then after a period of time, it literally, yeah, it became like the vinyl. <laughs> you had two CD decks and you had the vinyl decks. But the vinyl decks literally just ended up being a place where you could put your CDs on uh, and then play you everything off CD. And it just developed like that. But I always, on the CD decks, and even now I've got a, 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 a controller, um, where I just plug in my USB sticks um, and then I control all my music through that. But you've got a vinyl setting, so I just set it to vinyl. And it's like, it's, honestly, I've never stopped playing vinyl just because I haven't actually got the vinyl. I mean, when I basically lost everything materially, uh, my vinyl went and it, it was gone and, it, and I, never saw, I never saw it again. So, you know, that was a shame. But at the same time, it's actually, I don't know if you've ever seen a film with George Clooney called Up in the Air. Uh, where he's a, a motivational speaker at night and during the day he fires people as like a corporate kind of belt tightener type, you know, asset stripper type thing. Um, and it's a great film. And he says about, you know, putting the weight of everything you've collected through your life on your back in a backpack, metaphorically, taking it off, putting it down and setting fire to it. And that's basically what happens. So I no longer have to carry around huge amounts of vinyl. When I move house, it doesn't take me three weeks to move all the vinyl or anything like that. Everything's on USB stick. It's all over there on this little 64 gig stick, all the music I ever need. Um, and I still play like I'm playing on vinyl. Yes, got you. So that leads me into my next question, Mark, which will be, um, how often do DJs make fuck ups? And, they, they, <laughs> oh, and, and, and what have you experienced? Are there some big names that you've heard drop a few clonkers or? One of one of my favourites, one of my favourites, one of my my friends who we worked in the shop with me, great DJ, brilliant DJ, um, and I remember being it was at Full Circle, which was the Sunday afternoon club. So we, a lot of us had been awake all Saturday night, maybe had a couple of hours shut eye, but then go to this club on a Sunday afternoon. And I remember it being packed. It was always like you know a thousand odd people there. It was really like a buzzy place. Uh, nobody ever ate the chips, but they had to have the chips on just in case, right? Uh, but the point is, is no one, no one ever ate the chips. Uh, but the point is, is that um, uh, my friend was DJing, and the decks were here, and the mixer was here. So the decks were here, the mixer was here, and it, and you had to kind of like like move between the two, and you had to keep track of what was going on and your next record. And I just remember the club being packed, the atmosphere was up, everyone was getting really excited, really infused, like yeah, here we go, here we go. And all of a sudden, you just heard. You know, literally, he'd like, he picked up the, 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 record, the record that was playing. He picked it up, realised that he picked up the wrong one because it all went silent for a split second. Then he dropped the needle. But as he dropped the needle, it went bup, 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 and just, and literally the whole place was like, oh, no, right. And he just stood there and he was like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, sorry, sorry, my, my fault. And he turned all the volume down and started again and stuff like that. So, but listen, we've all, we've all made loads of mistakes. I mean, you know, the problem was for me was that I used to beat myself up about them. If I played what I perceived to be a bad set or I missed a couple of mixes or people didn't like my music very much, or I was in the wrong club and it wasn't the right crowd for me and all that. Honestly, I could find a myriad, hundreds of reasons uh, to beat myself up. And that would last quite a while. You know, I wouldn't let myself off the hook. I wouldn't forgive myself. I wouldn't go for, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't congratulate myself and go, those are all the positives. I'd look at all the negatives and be like, oh no, oh. you know, and that would affect me during the week. And then, you know, I'd be carrying that possibly into other gigs and stuff like that. So I didn't, I wasn't the smartest young man. I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I, you know, if I could go back and have a word with my 20 year old self, I would, uh, I would give him some good guidance. <laughs> Mark, listen, I, I've got the pleasure of talking to the wonderful Carol Decker in 15 minutes' time. I've just realised that. That's my fault for making us late, mate. I, I'm so sorry that... Well, actually, I'm, let's just blame the bloody technology. Cause hey, that, listen, I've, I've loved... I mean, I've, we could talk for, for days, can we? Yeah, we, we're not going to um, go, though, without coming on to what you're doing now. And... Um, and I, I look forward to chatting to you again, Marty. You're, you're such a great guy. I'd love that, man. We've got sort of shared experiences, although albeit you were up on the platform and I was on the dance floor. <laughs> well, most of the time. Um, but what is it then? Is someone 
you've got two things going on from what I can see, and I know you have a host of, of successful business interests, mm. but you've got the live coaching, which is getting people just to get a grip of themselves. And, 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 and I never say happiness. I say balance because, yeah, you're right. you know, when you can hop out of bed and it's your worst day ever and you're depressed and whatever. And if you can still go, do you know what? I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm just lucky to be here. And yeah. it's a great thing. Yeah. So you've got that going on, but you've also got um, the ability to make, make a few quid. Is that right? Or help people to make a few quid. What? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I've got numerous multiple sources of income something when I was bankrupt and living in my mum's spare room at like 38 years of age after a 20 year music career that saw some incredible highs next minute next thing I'm on the floor you know with an incurable disease next thing you know I'm bankrupt and living in my mum's spare room I'm like this could have gone better couldn't it so you know I started studying with Bob Proctor Tony Robbins I watched The Secret I started to get my head together and get information from successful people and I remember watching Bob Proctor at the time he was 75 he's now 86 at 75 years of age, he's got one of those like radio microphones and he's walking around on a stage talking to hundreds, if not thousands of people. I'm like, I'm going to do that. That's what I'm going to do because he's helping people and I love to help people. I did it with music, but I'm going to find other ways to do it going forward. Um, and all I did was I just studied successful people ever since. I've studied sources of income. I've studied all Tony Robbins life, life coaching. I've studied Kevin Green business and wealth coaching here in the UK. Um, and many, many other people, of course, in between with all my recommended reading. It's on my website. If you go to markwilkinsonofficial.com, it's all there. But I've studied all this stuff um, and then I've put it into practice. So I haven't taken anyone's word for it. I've gone, that's interesting. I'll try it. That's interesting. And I, as long as I keep, and every time it works, I go, I'll keep going, I'll keep going, I'll keep going. Yeah. And now, thankfully, I've got myself to a position where I can actually write my own book and then I can start to help other people with that. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. And I mean, you know, I asked many people and, you know, we did obviously the breakdown of the, the numbers earlier, but I asked many people, I say, well, how do you earn money? And they'll say, well, I'll get a job. I'm like, okay, right. That, you know, that's immediately, it's, it's, it's kind of pro program thinking, you know, it's kind of like what all the masses are doing. There's two ways to earn money. One is to add service and the other one, or the other, so one is give service and the other one is to add value. And as long as you're doing those two things, give service, add value, you will make money. It's just a fact. And we all have the same amount of hours in the day. So we just have to decide our worth and get on with it and get moving. So yes, life coaching is really, really important to me. And I help a lot of people through addictions, through anxiety, through fear, doubt, worry, all those things, depression, disease, all of that. And we've got big, big visions and goals of being able to go into addiction centers and or youth clubs and or schools and actually help people at a very nice young age so that they don't go through some of the traumas that perhaps we've spoken about, perhaps. Mark, can I just, I'm just going to chip in here because we've kind of, I've done you a disservice. So for our friends at home, in the height of Mark's DJing career, when he's on the world stage, he suddenly comes down with a crippling hmm. uh, autoimmune illness, hmm. which then knocked him on, if I can say, knock, knock you on your ass, Mark. And, yeah. and suddenly everything was different. As you said, you found yourself skint, your careers snatched away from you. What, what measures, and I'm, my mind's immediately, I'm just thinking of toxic Western diet here immediately, but, but I'm interested to see what you, what, what you think. What measures did you have to, what did you have to do to get better? So I would say it was 80, down to 80% stress and 20% diet. So the toxic Western diet definitely uh, had an impact. Uh, certainly the lifestyle that I was living the first time I had a big flare up of the dis-ease in my body uh, was, uh, was, was um, uh, an interesting moment. Uh, however, the real big moment for me was when Bob Proctor said on The Secret, a dis-ease is two words. You must put a hyphen in there. It's a dis-ease. And if you are at ease mentally and emotionally, uh, you will not get a dis-ease in your physical body. I'm like, whoa, hang on a minute. So the doctor's just told me I've got an incurable disease for the rest of my life, and you're telling me it's a dis-ease, and if I'm at ease, I won't have the dis-ease? What? So that was, I had to ask some serious questions, you know, but it was light bulb moment. I'm like, I need to study now. I need to get my head around it. And there's a great phrase that when the student is ready, the teacher will come. And I literally just, it just, I went from book to book to book to course to course to course to lesson to lesson to lesson, study, 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 and then put into practice myself. 
And the more I did it, the more successful I became. And the life that I live today, which is a very comfortable existence with my beautiful wife and our little puppy we've just got, uh, and multiple multiple businesses, a book out, being talking and in, being interviewed with you, Chris, this beautiful life that I've created for myself is the life that I envisioned 12 years ago when I first saw Bob Proctor with the mic and how he giving speeches. I'm now doing it. I'm not doing it in the physical world, but I'm doing it in the Zoom world, in the in the uh, internet world. And the next step for us will be to do live events. I do live events with Kevin Green anyway in the UK, but we'll be doing more uh, around Life Remix because we want to help more people. If we can help more people get their life sorted out into a nice balance, as you rightly say, then they've got an opportunity to go into business. And when they've got an opportunity to go into business, that's when they can really like see the joy and, and what they really deserve. Yeah, Mark, I'm just going to say here and now, I've been stood. It's the second time I've been stood up by Carol Decker. This is I'm getting a complex about this now. <laughs> so she's just emailed me to say um, she's running a bit behind. So we, what what I mean is we can relax. Don't worry, man. What I'm going to do, Mark, and this is a new thing I'm doing as a sort of little add-on video to the podcast is. I'm going to ask, I'm going to put a video out and it will be world class DJs 10 tips for life or, or for success or for whichever way you want to frame it. I'm going to do some talking now while, to give you a bit of time. If you can just write down 10 of your life philosophies that you teach when you're life coaching. Mm. Friends at home. Yes, it's very interesting what Mark says, because I was rushing through, I think, Exeter train station once. Uh, it might even have been Plymouth and I was going up to Exeter, maybe going back to the Marines or something. I thought I'd go and buy a book in the WH Smiths. And there was a book there and it was some, I don't want to say cliche title, but it was one of these how to take charge of your life and your mental and physical, it wasn't, wasn't actually physical self because back then, so we're talking uh, 30 years ago, people didn't understand that your body is related to your mind. You used to, you used to be like, you did sport for your body, that's great. And you, you do kind of reading books and philosophy and strategizing for your mind, not realizing, of course, the two are critically interlinked healthy body healthy mind etc etc so i read this book on the train i just got straight into it it was already give me these answers in life that wow yeah i'd not I, i'd not heard this before but it makes perfect sense so when i left the military i went to see the gentleman that i showed you um dun, dun, dun. do i need to should i get him back up there he is mr this is me and Tony Robbins. Oh. Yeah, the world-renowned business guru. Um, and when I left the Marines, I used my resettlement money, so my two and a half thousand pounds, to go and see Tony for a three-day seminar. Well um, done, mate. It was well worth it because I got off with an Ecuadorian girl. And... Um, she was delightful. <laughs> so that was worth the two and a half thousand pounds. The bonus was I got taught to do the fire walk, which, yeah. is, which I still can do to this day. Yeah. And um, I'll be honest, it's ironic that all my addiction stuff came after seeing Tony. So it says a lot about when you sow the seed and then you use it later. You know, that little gems of knowledge, which at the time... Biggest thing it helped me with, I'm going to say, was diet. It set me on the on the road to understanding my body's physiology and the, and more importantly the pH balance. Yes. Um, but going back to what Mark said, I'm now in this uh, delightful position that I'm quite proud of, where people are starting to book me as a speaker. Good man. Um, because the things that come out of my mouth make sense to people. Exactly right, mate. You know, and the crazy thing is they're just, they're all so simple. They're all, none of it's groundbreaking. And I'm sure Mark will testify to that, mate, hey? Absolutely. Listen, I mean, for me, you know, it, it's it's reasonably simple information. I think human beings, we can make our lives very, very complicated. complicated. We can, we're, we're, I was a master at it, actually. 
Uh, you can make your life very complex or you can make your life very simple. And a lot of the things I, I picked up as a youngster, I had to unlearn to relearn the stuff that I picked up from Robbins Proctor and now from all these wonderful people that we're going to, uh, that we talk about you know, in, in the, the teachers and the coaching. Mark, listen, um, stay on the line, mate, because I've got a couple of things I'd like to chat to you about um, after if you've got two, two minutes. Awesome, Love so it. Love I'm it. just going to play my, my outro sort of stuff. So when you, when you see me again, that's like, we're off air, everyone. Cut, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is I'm supposed to say. Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed this chat, mate, honestly. It, it's like that gap in my knowledge of, of my wonderful life that you've just filled in all those little, little blanks for me. Um, and we got to talk about drugs and sex and music. So, what else is, what else um, is there anything else? Oh, there's Throw food. a bit of success in there as well. We're yeah. good, yeah? We'll have to do food next time. But, um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank you ever so, ever so much. I'm going to put all your links below the video so people can um, hop onto your your success plans or your happiness plans and, and certainly read your wonderful book, Life Remixed. Thank you, mate. As I said, I, I get asked to read a lot of books, Mark. And I'll be honest, I like reading for me. It's one of the, my few special things and I don't get time to do it now because of the podcasts and stuff. I, I'm, I'm wading through Simon. I say wading, that's very rude. I didn't mean that, Simon. I'm tackling Simon Mann, the former SAS turned uh, mercenary um, who's been on the podcast. I'm trying to read his book at the minute and I can manage two pages a night and then I'm just, I'm, yeah. I'm bush. But what I will say is, so I get asked to read a lot of books. I get sent a lot of books. And if I go like that, sorry, my life's too short to read yeah. something that's either not well written not well presented or it, it it's just not what I'm interested in but your book as I said I couldn't put it down and that's uh that you've hit hit the spot as a DJ entrepreneur life coach and, and now author so it says a lot about this man folks pick up a copy of his book and come back on the podcast mate you know welcome anytime let's maybe do a little special about um mental health or, or, or something along these lines I'd love that, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if you see Brandon, can you tell him um, I want want my credit cards back? <laughs> and I'll tell Norman to stop texting you as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and to our friends at home, thank you for watching another episode of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. If you could like and subscribe, that helps the magic. Massive love to you all. And we'll see you next time.